Good morning. We welcome you, whoever you are and whomever you love. We are glad you are here on this Easter morning. I'm Matthew Johnson, the senior minister here at the church. My pronouns are he, him, and his. Our worship team this morning also includes our assistant minister, the Reverend Joyce Palmer, director of religious education, Lindsay Trang, music director, Tim Anderson, and the choir, and our worship associate, Teresa Palmino. Autumn Power office manager is running tech for us today. If you're in person, do join us for a coffee hour and snacks and conversation after the service. The noise of children is always welcome here, but please do silence your electronic devices. And if you are online, do like, comment, and share this worship service with others. If today is your first day worshiping with us or your first day in a long time, we are thrilled that you're here. Let us know who you are so we can be in touch. And I invite you to turn to those around you and say good morning. We will sing together this hymn we've been singing this month for this month of transformation. A promise through the ages rings. It is sort of an Easter hymn. It reminds us that that power of Easter and new life can come to us at any time of the year. So I invite you to rise in body and in spirit and sing together. We are worshiping in the homeland of indigenous Ho-Chunk and Potawatomi people and are humbled to be on this sacred ground. This land, this country, this liberal faith, and our very lives are inherited from the complicated intersections of oppression, freedom, resistance, migration, war, justice-making, and hope. From these legacies, we learn, grow, seek repair, give thanks, and build a better world for those who will inherit our choices. We gather today for worship, and as we gather, we join in our sacred ritual. The flaming chalice is a sim symbol of faith, a beacon of truth, a fire for justice, and a warmth for the soul. <clears throat> we have Audrey, who is six, and Lucy is three and a half, and today they get three Easter egg hunts. <laughs> They're super excited. <laughs> okay. Let us speak together the covenant of our church. 
Love is the spirit of this church, and reason is its God. To dwell together in peace, to seek truth in freedom, and to serve human need. This is our covenant. Now let's sing together our chalice response song. We gather and worship together. We gather and worship together. We begin with the prayers of the people and the naming of joy and sorrow and the holding and heart of those we love. On this day of Transgender Day of Visibility, we hold in our hearts all of our beloveds, known and unknown, who are transgender, non-binary, genderqueer, and gender non-conforming. Your lives are a blessing unto all of us, and we give thanks for your presence. We hold in our hearts all those recovering from illnesses and experiencing maladies of joy of body and soul. May mercy and healing attend them. We hold in our hearts with tender mercy the family and friends of Jacob Stolpak, his mother Ramona Stolpak, Jenna Newcomb, Jay Larson, and Jason Jenkins, who died this week, as you know, in Rockford, victims of violence. We pray for mercy and compassion for their families and loved ones, which may include some of you. This is a small town. May we resolve ourselves to be bearers of peace this day and all days to come. And I invite you in this space to name those aloud or in silence who you are holding in your heart. May the spirit of love and life be with all those named and unnamed. Each year on Easter, we celebrate a very lightly modified version of the communion from the 1935 Unitarian hymnal. When we first did communion together, gosh, I don't know, 10 years or something like that, from that 1935 Unitarian hymnal, it was probably the first time a bread and wine communion had been celebrated here since about 1942. But now we do it every year. And those of you who come every year know kind of what we do. This tradition, which is shared by a billion people around the world, is one in which people have many different interpretations. For Unitarians and Universalists, it has always been about a reminder of our duty to love one another and the teaching of love and a binding together of the community together. That's what this is about. Ours is an open table, which means anyone can participate if you wish to. You can also choose not to participate. So in a little bit, after the introductions and the prayers and the words, which basically are the same of the 1935 hymnal, we've hardly changed anything at all. And some of you remember this church using that hymnal, uh, which they used until the 1960s. I invite you to come forward. Um, I will be holding a bowl that has wine in it. Reverend Joyce will be holding a bowl that has grape juice in it. Um, there is bread to pick up, and we use the intinction method, so you stick it in the wine and eat. There is also in the small bowl some gluten-free crackers if you have celiac or another reason why you might need that. So when that time comes, you can come up down the center and come back around the side. Everybody got it? Okay. Here is the 1935 script. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Dearly beloved, we have received it that Jesus, on the night before he died, as he supped with his disciples in an upper chamber, took bread and broke it, likening it to his crucified body, and poured out wine as a visible parable of the shedding of his blood. As we repeat this act in remembrance of him, may the spirit which kept him steadfast even unto death be quickened in us. May we remember also that the bread and wine have been to Christians in all ages a sign of their fellowship with him and with one another a source of strength, a witness to the power of sacrificial love. 
Conscious of the weakness of our own hearts and of the needs of our fellows, let us here renew our communion with him and with all faithful servants of God who have found strength and joy in doing the will of God upon, upon earth. Let us pray. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that, way, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name. We come not into thy presence, most holy Lord God, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and abiding mercies, remembering this day the great heart and passion of a son of man of long ago. We are ashamed of our selfish and imperfect lives. We would here be turned to the way of his brave and tender spirit and find that wholeness of life will shall be at once a divine blessing for us and a divine ministry from us. Forgive our failures and shortcomings, and by thy grace, strengthen our weak desires for goodness, that we may henceforth serve thee without fear and without shame all the days of our lives. Amen. Let us read responsively the Beatitudes. Let us hear the words of Jesus which speak of thy way of blessedness. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Thou shalt love the Lord God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. And the second is like unto it, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And all the laws and the prophets. Let the bread here set apart from the bounty of the earth be to us a token of all the good we receive and cannot ourselves affect. And let us with quiet hearts wait for that highest good of all, the presence and spirit of God. Let the wine here outpoured be to us a token of the self-forgetting good which all must needs do for others if they are to share the fullness of the divine blessing. And let us offer ourselves not to be ministered unto, but to minister. Let us pray. Infinite and Holy One, we would present ourselves, our souls and bodies, to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice unto thee. And we pray that as the grain once scattered upon the mountains is here gathered into one bread, so thy separated children of every nation, kindred and tongue may, by thy grace, 
be united in one living spirit of righteousness and peace. And as this wine came forth from the fruit of the vine, so may thy people, continually abiding as branches of the true vine, bring forth the fruit of good living to thy glory. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the same manner, he also took the cup when he had supped, saying, the cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. I invite you to come forward if you wish.
I invite you to join me in the Lord's Prayer, which will be printed on the screen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which path us all understanding, that peace which the world can neither give nor take away, abide in our hearts to bless us this day and forevermore. Amen. Good morning, I'm Lindsay, and my pronouns are she and her, and I'm so thrilled to see everybody here for the Easter egg hunt this morning. So just a few little notes to make the morning a success, and then we'll be on our way. Um, first of all, I'd like to send a big thank you to um, Kendra, Veronica, Keith, Cooper, Gracie, and Patterson for their help setting up this morning. Make a great team. We knocked it out. We had some time for coffee and donuts, so it was an <laughs> excellent setup this morning. Um, so as we head out of the sanctuary, Patterson and Gracie will be back by the doors, and they'll be passing out a little slip of paper <laughs> to <laughs> all of the people that will be participating in the Easter egg hunt. On your piece of paper is a special number that's just your number and a number of colored eggs that will need to be collected. So hopefully all of you came with a Easter egg receptacle. If you do not have one, we have a couple of extra ones at the door and Patterson and Gracie can help you with that as well. So you'll take your sheet of paper and your bucket and your adult and you'll head outside. You'll look for your special numbered egg and then the uh, variety of colored eggs that are listed on your sheet of paper. When you've found all of those, you can bring them to the table where we'll trade them in for a little treat bag. Um, it's a little bit chilly today, so I didn't plan a lot of additional outside activities, but uh, the playgrounds are both open, and of course there's always delicious things to eat and coffee and deal hall afterwards. So if you'll join us in singing the first verse of this little light of mine, we'll head out the back of the sanctuary. I hope you subscribe to the Kairos, our weekly newsletter. Please be sure to read it for announcements about upcoming events and activities. This week, I want to highlight our Getting to Know UU sessions. These sessions are designed to provide people new to the congregation with information about our history, beliefs, programs, and how you can get connected here. We have a series of videos for you to watch first to provide grounding in our faith then in-person sessions on Sunday mornings at 11.15, right here in the sanctuary. Our next session is on Sunday, April 14th, Getting Connected. The link to the videos is in Kairos, and the sessions repeat each month. Each month, we'll highlight the activities of one of our Faith in Action teams. Today, we pivot to our racial and economic justice team, so I want to invite Gloria to come up to tell you what they are doing. My name is Gloria Perez. Along with Kathy Madison, I co-lead the Racial and Economic Justice Team. My pronouns are she, her, and Aya. I'm here to invite you to a wonderful Wednesday this coming Wednesday, April 3rd. It's at Inscape Collective, uh, co-sponsored by the Echo Justice Team. 
the focus on this, um, on this, the focus will be on personal stories from three Rockfordians about their experiences in being unhoused, information on resources for the unhoused population, and conversation about ways our community might fill, fill in some of the gaps in, of uh, support that those who are working on this issue. Snacks will be provided. Uh, there's more information in the Kairos, so you can check that out and um, see the exact address. Timing is, um, will start at six o'clock. We also want to invite you to our regular monthly meetings on the second Sunday of each month after church in the library. We now take up an offering to support the work of justice and mercy in the world. 80% of what's collected today will go to Unitarian Universalist Ministry for Earth, whose vision is a world in which reverence, gratitude, and care for each other and for the living earth are central to the lives of all people. Thank you for your generosity. The offering will now be given and gratefully received. My name is Teresa Palmino. My pronouns are she, her. Today we celebrate Easter. Easter celebrates a resurrection, a coming to life again. And this month, our theme is transformation. From birth to the age of 18, I lived in five different states in Washington, DC, eight different homes, and went to 10 different schools. I was always the new girl. 
Talk about changes. I was 15 when we moved to Rockford, and I had decided to leave the old me behind. No more trying so hard to make friends, no more tolerating the bully. I decided that if you didn't like me, that was your loss. Two years later, I had more friends than all my old friends put together. I came alive. Then I grew up. <laughs> I had a wonderful counselor tell me once that what I was feeling was grief. No one had died, but life had taken an unexpected turn, and my hopes and dreams for the future had to be set aside. Parenthood is not for everyone, I know. I didn't want kids or a partner that I had to clean up after. <laughs> Especially <that. clears throat> the, <laughs> the unexpected turn was becoming a mother. In caring for my four kids, I found my joy. My heart knew what my mind did not, and I came alive again, over and over again, loving them. When my kids grew up, I came, became emotionally attached to things. Not expensive things, I loved yard sales. <laughs> Why? It's so pretty. I might need it someday, or I want to fix it. Or the kid made it in kindergarten, or for no reason, I just can't throw it away. The last time I moved, with the help of my kids, I learned to separate my emotions from objects. I started going out again, meeting new people, making new connections, and I came alive again. There are times in everyone's life when the scariest word is change. With change comes the unknown, also a bit scary at times. You hang on, trying to keep everything the way it is, not wanting to let go. <clears throat> Even when the way things are isn't working for you anymore. I can fix this, you tell yourself. Why should I think or do things differently, you ask yourself. Why change? So you can be renewed, transformed, see a new world and come alive again. Start small, it's okay. Thank you. We're gonna to sing together. I invite you to rise and body your spirit for now the green blade riseth.
keep seated. Delighted to see 40% of the congregation go off to look for <laughs> eggs. And how great, so wonderful. Two readings this morning. The first from my friend and colleague, the Reverend Molly House Gordon. She begins with verses one through five of chapter 16 of the gospel according to Mark. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so they might go and anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. And then Molly continues. She writes, the women were there to the very end. They watched as his body was taken down and wrapped in linen and placed in a tomb. I imagine them wailing, keening, or perhaps their limbs felt as heavy as their hearts. Perhaps you too have experienced that spectrum from raging to frozen grief. The earliest telling of the story ends in bewilderment for the women of the story and for the reader alike. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. That is the original ending to the Gospel of Mark. Could Jesus really rise again? Could it really be that the violence of empire and the pain of loss would be denied the final word? In that ancient telling, we don't get an answer. There is no resolution. There is no certainty. There is only a seed of complicated hope and the persistence of human love to help it grow. What strikes me about the ancient text is that it was not only Jesus who rose up that morning. It was also the women who loved him, who rose up from the pit of their grief to tend to him. It was also the movement that his teaching sparked, a community who rose up to spread his message of power and weakness and the victory of love. Is new life possible? Is love stronger even than death? The question itself invites us to rise up and to live as though it were true, to make it true in our living. The lesson for the women, for the forces of empire, for us, is this. You can crush love down, bury it, cover it over, but it will rise. It will reach for the sun, and we will reach for each other. Love will have the final word. Even if that word is just a question, a wild possibility, a whisper to rise and follow wherever it may lead, communities formed and nurtured in love will rise up for and with each other again and again. If we've learned nothing else these years, it is this. Even when everything is uncertain, even when we are grieving, even when the loss keeps coming, even when we are forced apart, even when we are bone weary, we keep reaching for one another. We keep rising in love. The second reading is from the Unitarian Universalist poet and traveling troubadour some of you have met, Rick Maston. His poem is called, On Butterfly Wings. You know, for the life of me, I can't recall what happened last Good Friday. Christmas I can because mother got smashed and the baby, seeing his image distorted on a thousand ornaments, cried all day. And on Easter it rained, so that the candy hidden in the grass got sticky, and we had to wash the ants off before we let the kids out. <laughs> but somehow I missed Good Friday. Looking the other way, I guess, like I do, when I pass someone walking the roadside with an empty gas can, I distract myself by muttering under my breath about the high cost of funerals and how the undertakers are bleeding us dry like vampires, not stopping to realize that we can't pay those guys enough to handle what scares us half to death. I mean, if Aunt Maud bites the bag in my kitchen, you're gonna find me outside in the yard waiting for some weird cat to roll up in a long black vehicle and clean up the mess, cart the problem away, smiling all the while. Oh. I'll stop in the parlor Saturday afternoon, check the flowers out, and have a quick look in the box. But then I was never able to accept a gift graciously, and it's my loss. 
And no doubt the reason I sit in my own small house drinking coffee, feeling homesick most of the time. An old guru once told me the only thing we really have to do in this life is die. And I think I shall repeat this statement over and over a hundred times each night before going to sleep. Perhaps if I could bring myself to believe it, I mean really believe it, and remember what happens on Good Friday. I just might come out and find myself some sunny Easter morning on butterfly wings rising. I invite you to join me in the spirit of prayer and meditation. To breathe in, breathe out, and enter a time of silence. In the spirit of love and life, God of many names and no name at all, your own heart and mind may speak to you and comfort you in your grief and in your hope, in your loss and in your love. Let us be silent. Amen.
Yay. <laughs> Harry Belafonte traveled the world learning folk songs, listening to the rhythms, listening to the stories, especially to those songs of Africa and the African diaspora, the rhythms of the Caribbean, Calypso, and the songs of West Africa, whose people were forcefully relocated, kidnapped, held in the dark, lives dismissed murdered and assaulted, ripped from their families and their homes. Belafonte listened to those songs and recorded them to help preserve and save the music. Calypso music originally originated in Trinidad and Tobago in the 17th century from enslaved people sung in a French creole with a West African rhythm, an ancestral memory and an act of resistance and assertion of humanity. As the music spread and was put into English a few centuries later, the planters and powers realized that the music was political, not just a little fun song, a way to challenge their power. The structure of Calypso music allowed the singers to use them to spread news. Like a medieval herald, they could change the words as the news changed, including news of freedom and naming of corruption and evil. A lot of the songs were really making fun of the planters and the powers that be. The double entendres, the codes, and the Creole language was understood by some and deliberately obscure to others. It's just a happy song, thought the planters. I'm sure they told themselves that. It was not. <coughs> Belafonte was in Guinea in Africa when Turn the World Around came to him. So I'm going to quote his own words about the song that you just heard. And these are words that he shared before he introduced the song for the first time on, some of you remember, The Muppet Show in 1979, which Jim Henson has called the proudest show he ever produced. And Harry Belafonte sang Turn the World Around at Jim Henson's memorial. So here's what Belafonte says about Turn the World Around. In a little village, I met with a storyteller. That storyteller went way back into African tradition, into African mythology. He began to tell a story about the fire, which means the sun, and about the water, and about the earth. And he pointed out that all these things put together turn the world around, and that all of us are here for a very, very short time. And in that time that we are here, there really isn't any difference in any of us if we take time out to understand each other. And the question is, do I know who you are? Do you know who I am? Do we care about each other? Because if we do, together we can turn the world around. He said this to that Calypso beat, that sound of resistance, that sound of memory, that sound of life. You tried to kill us, but we sing. You tried to bury us, but we rise. When the Sabbath was over, Mary, Mary, and Salome brought spices. My dear friend Molly reminds us that in the original ending of Mark, this is the story. They are bewildered. The cave is empty. They flee. We don't know what happened, not in the original text. We are invited to enter the bewilderment with them, the unknowing, the cave, to enter the cave. Earlier this week, the Unitarian Universalist Association's president, Reverend Dr. Sophia Betancourt, an Afro-Latina UU minister and ethicist who has written about folk ecological resistance movements in Panama, just to connect back to that part of the world, Sophia reminded us not to skip Good Friday. She shared an essay from one of my doctoral professors, Miguel de la Torre, an evangelical Baptist whose commitment to liberation theology has pushed him to the edges of orthodox theology, about how when we ignore the suffering, we cannot experience the true freedom of new life. The audacity of hope, the contingency of love, its radical power, when we shave off the edges, when we try not to make any big changes, the colors are dulled. In liberation theology, God is in solidarity with the suffering, and all are invited to see how we all might be in solidarity with one another. We all suffer sometimes, some more often and more deeply, but it is in our collective contingency and our mutual liberation that we're invited to move toward. But to get there, we must enter our cave, enter the dark, be in grief, know what we have lost. 
You can't pay those guys enough to handle what scares us half to death. Ministers, funeral directors, firefighters, nurses, cops, we encounter death and dying and suffering more than most. It changes you. I'm thinking of those this week who stepped into the breach once more, who stepped into the cave where so many fear to tread. But it is in the cave where the illusions are stripped away. An old guru once told me, wrote Rick Maston, the only thing we really have to do in this life is die. The caterpillar doesn't hibernate. She dissolves, lets go completely, enters the cave of non-being, of loss and suffering. There's no way around, only the way through. My son and I went to caves this week for spring break. This picture is from one of them. He loves caves, so we plotted a trip to Kentucky, and I learned a lot about different types of caves. We went in narrow ones with dripping stalactites and growing stalagmites, and now I can tell you the difference between those things. We went in ones that were huge and dry. It's the presence of sandstone over the limestone that makes it dry and so large. I kept telling my son that these caves looked unreal, like they were out of a movie set, but real they were. In most of them, the guide would get us to hold on to someone and turn out the lights. The pitch black is like literally nothing else. When you turn out the lights up top, the stars shine brighter, and when your eyes adjust, you're amazed by their brilliance. In the cave, there's no adjusting. There's no light at all. A few guides told us that your brain will fill in an image because it wants to see something. So you can sort of try this with me if you want to. Close your eyes tightly. You can do this if you want to. And place one hand in front of your face. Put your thumb on your nose so you know where your hand is. Now wiggle your fingers. Do you see your fingers? And then they would turn on the lights, and you can open your eyes. I admit I fell for this the first time, as did half of our group making this face together. <laughs> I did not fall for it the second time. I'm not very smart, but I'm a fast learner. But the cave, the dark in the cave is really dark. It's really dark, like nothing you've ever seen. And yet, in the dark, there was something comforting. The caves were beautiful when the light would shine on them. The layers of rock, the eternity of time marked out to sea. The last cave we went to on our last day there had been highly polluted, unusable and unsafe after decades of industrial and agricultural waste, and the town's sewage had been just dripped and dropped down into the cave. But in the early 1990s, they started cleaning it up. And it wasn't long before the animals, the cave crickets, the salamanders, we got to see one of them, orange with little black spots, and the bats and the eyeless fish, returned. It was a huge cave, the largest chamber, 10 times the size of this room, and a river flowing through the bottom of it, now clean after decades of being dirty. It was stunning. The cave has come back from death. It had come back from death. Walking up the 150 steps out of that cave, I knew what my Easter sermon was going to be about. <laughs> You go into the cave, like the woman come to anoint the body, like the grieving nephew, terrified. You go in, into the dark, the unknown, the loss and the suffering and the grief. You name the tragedy, the contingency and the suffering. You get low, maybe in the mud. The pain is all around us in our town, in our country, in the world, from Charles Street to Rafa and everywhere in between, the pain is real. Do not deny. Remember what happens on Good Friday. Experience the solidarity of bewilderment. Get in the dark. Be there. Be changed there. Turn the world around. We come from the earth and the water and the fire and the spirit. Turn the world around. Turn yourself around and come out into the light newborn. 
so is life. Now the green blade riseth from the buried grain. Love is come again. When our hearts are in pain, love's touch can bring us back to life. Is it so? I say yes. Now there's no shortcut. If you want to be a butterfly, you must dissolve. Remember what happens on Good Friday. And then you might rise as if on wings. It isn't easy, but we don't have to do it alone. Our liberation, our transformation is collective. The women come together to the tomb, and it is in community that life returns to them. The meaning is made and hope is real. As Molly put it, love will have the final word, even if that word is just a question. Even when everything is uncertain, we keep reaching for one another. We keep rising in love. So is life. We want to know each other. Do we know each other, our stories, our hearts? This is where transformation lives, when we tell our stories of going through the caves of our lives, when we share our heart, when we listen. We begin to shape a new world. Solidarity, community, the spirit of love, it's how we turn the world around. Calypso music is sung in community. Oh, there's a, a lead, but everyone makes the rhythm. Sings along, claps along, passes it along. We, our, us. Do we know where we come from and what we are for? From the earth, the fire, the water, from the spirit. Death does not need to have the last word. Transformation is a possibility, waiting. It's not a sure thing. And there will be losses and grief and hard places. But death is not the last word. Life is more. Love is more. Alleluia. Love is more. If we are courageous enough to enter the dark and learn the lessons there, to hold on to each other, to make the climb down and the climb up, courageous enough to reach out and keep reaching out, then there is more. There's more life and love and hope, not for some, but for all. Our liberation is collective. Alleluia, blessed be. Our songs of joy are truly joyful when we have been in solidarity with our suffering. Our new beginning begins when we let go of what was, when we embrace our life, our homesickness might end, our journey might begin. We might sing Alleluia. On this Easter morning, I invite you to enter the cave, make friends with the dark, grieve the losses and mourn the dead. Know that love continues. Be open to possibility. Become, come up together, turn the world around and be glad for the gift of life. Alleluia and blessed be. I wanted to sing an Alleluia. We had chosen Turn the World Around, and Tim said, there's a Calypso, Alleluia. So we're going to do the Calypso, Alleluia. I invite Tim to come up and lead us, and I invite you to give it all you've got today. I told the choir, we've done this exactly once in the last 20 years, I know. <laughs> and it was an unmitigated disaster only because we didn't plan accordingly. This morning we have a plan. If you, you can ignore the blessed be part, just focus on the alleluia part, we're all gonna sing the same thing. This is a round, but we're not going to sing it as a round. The choir is gonna sing some of the other parts so that we have harmonies going on, but we're all gonna sing the same thing and you're all gonna sing what I sing and I'm gonna play these to help us stay together. <laughs> See, we have a plan. <laughs> so let me sing your part. Alleluia, sing alleluia. And you can sing it in whatever octave you like. It, it carries better if I sing it up. Will you do that with me?
So really, you only have to worry about the very first line. Everything else is somebody else's part. <laughs> so we're going to do that. We're going to do that a few times. Barb's going to play some drums for us. The choir is going to come in with the other parts, and we're just going to keep doing it. And if you feel like moving, well, then by all means, move. <laughs> That's perfectly fine. So we'll rise in body or spirit. And you're with me. Here we go. planning and leadership, look what we can do. <laughs> Teresa will extinguish our chalice, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry with us until we are together again. While she does that, I invite you to join hands for our benedictions. If you'd rather not be touched, place your hands in your pockets or on your shoulders. The words of our benediction from the Unitarian minister, Clark Dewey Wells. God of Easter and infrequent spring, announce the large covenant to deceitful lands. Drive the sweet liquor through our parched veins. Lure us to fresh schemes of life. Rouse us from tiredness, self-pity. Wet us for use. Fire us with good passion. Restore in us the love of living. Bind us to fear and hope again. We'll sing together our sung blessing. 